Okay, well, welcome back to this series on uh, the, the home buying process. This is probably going to be one of the most important videos, I think, or most informative for you. It might run a bit long, but it's definitely important because we're talking about the disclosures. And the most important disclosure is the loan estimate, the fees. How do you look at that and read that document to know what you're getting? And, and so we're going to go over that in detail. Now, in general, I will tell you that on your initial disclosures, and this will vary from state to state, but in general, you might see about 180 to 190 pages of stuff the lender gives you. And that can be very overwhelming. Now, out of that there, I always tell my clients, well, they're all important. The loan estimate, that's the one you want to look at. Because all the other ones are basically the standard disclosures that go along for that state. And a lot of it's just that stuff we're used to seeing where uh, just attorneys come up with things. So, so for example... It's nine pages of disclosures to disclose your three credit scores. So if you have two borrowers, it's 18 pages just to tell you what your three credit scores are. And the three pages that follow that are exactly the same for all three. I don't know why they don't use a paper reduction act and just put that on, on one thing. But then you'll have all kinds of disclosures as far as like don't commit loan fraud. Good advice there. Definitely don't do that. Uh, your Fair Credit Reporting Act. So there's, there's things that it says that lender doesn't discriminate on uh, uh, against you based on credit. Credit reporting companies don't discriminate your score based on protected classes. And so it's a lot of this type of legal stuff that just has to go out. And so that's why I say, you know, read it, make sure you know what you're signing. But the thing you want to focus most on and what we're going to talk about in this video is the loan estimate. So let's go ahead and just dive into it here. So um, I just created an example here. Now, a loan estimate is a federal form. So this is going to be the same for all states that are used. The fees and how they break out, which we'll go over, can vary from state to state, but this is the form they're going to put it on. Now, a loan estimate, because it is a legal agreement that once a lender issues it, there's certain requirements, which we'll touch on as we go through this. You won't get an actual official loan estimate like this until you're under contract. Uh, if you're doing a purchase or doing on a refinance until the lender has the minimum required information, and then once they have that, they must disclose this. This loan estimate, once the lender has all the requirements that they need, they are to re required by law to send you this within three business days. Now, if you're looking and shopping around trying to decide which lender do I want to work with, you know, you, you know you want to work with a good, reputable uh, lender, but you also, once you have found a few of those that you feel comfortable with, now you want to see, well, what's the fees look like? They won't send you this, but you can request a fee estimate or fee sheet. It'll be a different format, but it's going to show the same information and that would allow you to make that informed decision. So here today, again, we're going to go over all this, this three pages here. And again, this might be a bit of a long video, but this is really important information if you're buying a house, because this is the heart of it. Everything here should be what you're expecting from the lender after your conversations. And if not, get clarification. And it's okay if you get this and you're not quite sure, don't automatically jump to the conclusion that the lender did something wrong. It might just be miscommunication because again, if you don't work with this stuff every day, you may have forgot some of the stuff in the prior conversation. So be kind and give your lender the benefit of the doubt. Um, but if if it is turning out to be definitely something different and this is not what you were talking about, it's completely different, that is a red flag and something to be, um, be, be mindful of. All right, so here we jump into it. Up here, we have the date issued. So when did the lender do this uh, estimate? You might get several estimates throughout the process of your loan. Um, so anytime there's a, a, a change that has material change to the loan estimate, the lender is going to send you a new one. That new one will then overplace the old one. And then you wanna make sure the most recent one you have is what you're now expecting. So um, so don't be afraid if you're gonna move forward. You think, well, actually, I think I might do a different down payment and have a different loan amount. You can still sign your loan estimate to show you've got it and then just request they send you an updated one uh, with whatever changes you've decided. Uh, property address, make sure that's correct. This is the purchase price. So does that match up with your uh, purchase contract? In this video, we'll just go ahead and, and assume this is a purchase. If it's a refinance, again, this is going to be the same document. Uh, you just wouldn't have a sales price, but you'd have a loan amount. And most everything else will kind of flow through. Uh, over here is your loan term. So is this what you're expecting? Uh, are you expecting a 30 year term, but they put 20? That'd be a reason to give a call. Uh, it lets you know the program. Is it conventional? So Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, or is it FHA, VA? Uh, if it's different, like USDA, I'm not sure why they didn't honor USDA with their own little box, but they didn't. So if it's a USDA, then it would mark this. 
or maybe you have a jumbo loan or some type of non-traditional type loan, then they would mark this here as other and fill in the loan program that's there. Now, this is a really important one right here, rate lock. Um, are you expecting that your rate is already locked? If so, and you get the loan estimate and you think it's locked and it's marked no, give your lender a call. Or if you were wanting not to lock the rate because for whatever reason you wanted to float, you thought rates would get better, but the lender locked it anyway, again, give the lender a call. It really is up to you on when you want to lock the rate. The lender's job is to give you the best information to advise you uh, and then let you make that decision. Um, now, down here is the loan amount. So does that make, uh, is that in line with what you're expecting? Here's your interest rate. Uh, now, interest rates change all the time. So again, you know, if you talk with your lender like a week ago and then you go under contract and they finally get accepted, they get the document out. If the rate's a little bit different, ideally the lender would have called and let you know that so it wasn't a surprise to you. But again, if it's a little bit different, it could simply be the change in the market. And we'll talk about that a bit more on page two here. Um, so again, just make sure this is not a surprise. This would be your principal and interest payment, okay? So if this is a 30-year fixed rate loan, this is the portion that does not change over time. Your taxes and your homeowner's insurance might go up over time, and if that's built into your payment, your payment will then change over time, but your loan, the principal and interest does not. These no's basically mean that the loan amount cannot change. This is not a negative amortization loan. Your interest rate cannot change, so it's not an adjustable rate mortgage. If it is, it would be marked yes, that's not a bad thing, but it should not be a surprise to you that it's marked yes. Uh, principal and interest, same thing. If these two are no, this should be no. So um, if this could change, then this would change. If any of these two could change, this would. But if they don't, this should stay the same. Prepayment penalty. Now, again, most of the time, if you're looking at a primary residence, you're not going to have a prepayment penalty. But if you're buying an investment property and you're using uh, maybe a, a non-traditional, non-conforming loan, which just because it's non-conforming doesn't mean it's bad. So um, it's just different. It's just not Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. But some of those loans, in order to get you a better rate, might have a one-year, two-year, or three-year prepay. So if it does, it would be marked yes. And again, that's not good, and I'm not saying it's bad. It just be, should be something you're aware of and have that conversation so it's not a surprise. And then same thing here at the balloon payment. A balloon payment means, say you're in a loan. Again, if you're buying a primary residence, for the most part, you're just not going to see this here. But if you're doing some type of maybe private type loan on an investment property and the, the lender is like, okay, well, make your payments based on a 30-year term or what we call a 30-year amortization. That's what calculates this payment here. However, at the end of five years, we want paid off in full. Then you would see this be marked yes. And you would, uh, again, not good, not bad, just different, and just something you should be aware of before you see this box marked yes. As we go down here then, what we see is just how this breaks out for payment. Now, even if you choose to have your taxes and homeowner's insurance paid by yourself later, you don't want it built into your monthly payment, uh, you would still see those here because this is just to reflect to you the, the full cost of owning this home on a monthly basis. Uh, and so here you can see we have homeowner's insurance, uh, I mean, mortgage insurance, because they're not putting 20% down. So there's some mortgage insurance there. Um, and again, mortgage insurance, is, it's not that it's bad. It's not that it's good. Just know what it is, how it works, and then it's just fine. Um, escrow, so this is your taxes and your homeowner's insurance. And here's your payment. Here, what this shows us is based on this scenario, if they made their payments on time every time, then the mortgage insurance would naturally drop off and go away by year 13, so the payment would drop, assuming taxes and insurance did not change. Now, reality is taxes and insurance change, so that's built into your monthly payment. Uh, this will you know, definitely change over time. But that's the idea is to show you that um, they know for sure that this will drop off if you make your payments on time uh, as planned. Now, down here is how you know whether or not this here is actually gonna be part of your monthly payment or if you're expected to make that payment on your own. So here, these are both marked yes. So both taxes and insurance are being built into the payment. So what that means is every month, one twelfth of your property taxes and one twelfth of your homeowner's insurance is being put into what's called an escrow or an impound account. That's a separate account that's held for your benefit. It is your money that's set there. And as that gets put into it, then when the homeowner's insurance comes due, the servicer will pay that out of those monies. And then when the property taxes come due, the servicer will pay that out of those monies. If at any point 
those accounts don't have enough money to make those payments because your homeowner's insurance went up or your property taxes went up, the lender will notify you about that and they will adjust your payment going forward. Now, you just sit up here, you can't adjust my payment. They can't adjust your principal and interest on a 30 year fixed rate loan. But your actual payment to the servicer can change as it relates to if your mortgage insurance changes, if it goes down over time, or if your tax and insurance go up or down, then your payment can change. That's really important because people get confused on that thinking that it would never change. It's the principal and the interest of the loan that does not change. So it is possible to have both of these marked no and it's not gonna be collected. Uh, it's possible to have one marked yes and one marked no. And others would here would be, uh, do you have an HOA due? Do you have flood insurance? If you had other types of expenses associated with this property, then it would be marked other and then it would let you know if it is or is not included. Now, at the very bottom of page one, we get the summary of the estimated closing costs from page two and the estimated cash to close. It's kind of all right here. Here's your, your loan amount, your interest rate, your payment, uh, your cash, your closing costs, and your cash to close. But we really want to look at this on page two because uh, people often call me concerned saying, oh my goodness, that, that's a lot of closing costs because this here just says closing costs. But what this doesn't do is show you that, well, this is closing costs, but it's also your prepaid taxes to get money set aside to pay the, pay the taxes and they come due. The first year's homeowner's insurance. And th these are things that are more cost of owning the home. If you paid cash for your home, you're probably still gonna insure that with homeowner's insurance. You most definitely are gonna have to pay property taxes. But because you're buying it with a loan, there's monies that are required to be paid up front and put aside in those accounts. So again, don't think that that's all going to your lender and we'll see this in detail on page two. The other thing this does not do, and this is a federal form, so you can't change it, is that there are sometimes credits associated with this that don't show up on this here. So I'll give you an example with that on page two. And then this is your cash to close. So this should be pretty much expecting what you're expecting for cash to close. Uh, and hopefully your lender has gone over this with you somewhat, uh, well, not somewhat, has gone over this before they sent it. So it's not a, you know, a mystery to you. Okay, and if, you, if it is a complete mystery, you had no clue at all that you hadn't talked fees at, at this point and you're already under contract, again, a red flag. Um, so here's page two, and we're gonna break out into different categories here, and certain categories have what we call zero tolerance, which means they cannot change the fees at all. Other categories have uh, a 10% tolerance, so as long as the fees quoted uh, are not more than 10% in total, then the lender is fine, doesn't have to redisclose. And then other items can change by as much as they need to. They're, they can, you know, there's no limit on how much they change. And we'll go over each of those. So box A is your lender fees here. Now, when you look at multiple lenders, you can see it can be very different, a little bit confusing to where, uh, looking at numbers, you might think that one's more expensive than the other, but in reality, when you look at A and B together, um, they may not be. So I'll go over this again. This is what's going to take a little time on the video, but I think it will be very helpful for you in understanding your loan estimate when the time comes. So in this case here, in this scenario, and this is just a sample here, um, and this is state of Oregon. Again, uh, some of these fees will look different for different states, but box A and B, probably not so much. But here you have um, your processing. So this lender is charging a processing fee and an underwriting fee. So that's what they're collecting. That's going to be paid from escrow directly to them. Then in addition to that, the interest rate above that the lender is quoting you on that day had a cost of 0.996% or, or based on of the loan amount. So based on your loan amount, that's $4,059. Now, when we talk about rates getting better or getting worse. What we're really saying is whatever given rate you're looking at, the cost of that rate is getting higher or getting lower. Now, if the cost of the rate gets so high because the market's just gone the wrong way, then you might choose to take a higher rate to get those closing costs back down the line, AKA rates are higher. But what I wanna really point out here is when we say rates are higher, it doesn't mean that you can't get that lower rate. It just might mean that it doesn't make sense to pay that fee. When rates go lower, the reverse of that is true. It might get that the market has improved so much that you are hoping to pay about a 1% discount fee. Well, now that rate you were looking at is giving you, uh, is maybe only charging a half a percent. And so you decide, you know what? I want the lower rate. So I'll keep my cost the same. I'll take the lower rate. So that's what's happening. So as long as your rate's not locked, this is going to change by as much as the market changes. 
Um, these fees here cannot change. The lender should know what their fees are. So there's no reason for them to have to ever come back and change their fees, but the rate can change. Now, box B, these are uh, third party services that are required to process and fund the loan, but you have no choice over who the lender uses. The lender makes that choice. So here we have the appraisal. The lender chooses what appraisal management companies they use to process and, and assign appraisers to that order. And because of that, these fees here cannot be more than what's quoted unless there was a valid change in circumstance that allowed it. So for example, with the appraisal fee, let's say the appraiser, um, you, we get the order, uh, the appraiser gets assigned, but then the appraiser says, due to the complexity of the report or the distance of the property, that they're actually gonna charge $925. If that was the case, then the lender would have three days to redisclose and let you know what they got as the actual quote, um, or they would be on the hook for the $25. But if they order the report, and the appraiser says, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it for $850, then at the end, you will only pay $850, even though they quoted $900. So these are straight pass-through fees. They're being paid directly to third parties. Your lender is not earning an income. They're not adding anything to this fee. Now, credit report fees can be a little bit different um, here because um, there's a lot of other fees you can see down here. So right now we're only seeing uh, three, but sometimes you'll see like tax service fee uh, would be another one. Um, there could be several different ones. Um, but for some lenders, they roll all these fees into one provider. So maybe their credit reporting company is providing the tax service fees and the flood certification fees and so on and so forth. And so um, you may not see those listed out. You might just see a higher credit report fee. Or you might see a lender that has a lower credit reporting fee, but then they have three or four different items listed here that have different costs associated with it. So you're really, again, wanting to add these up to see kind of what they come to aggregate um, and just how they do it. It's not a wrong or right way. It's just different ways in which businesses um, do their business. So that's box B, third party items, the lender orders on your behalf. And because they do that, these fees cannot exceed, but can always come in less than, um, they can only exceed what was quoted if there's a valid change circumstance, which is, fed, there's a list of federal government says this, these are reasons why you could. And then they have within three business days from the time they know about that, if they wait more than three days to make that change after learning about the change, then they're on the hook for it. Now, box C here, these are items in which you can shop for, okay? So these are third-party items. Um, the lender does not tell you what title company to use. Now, in purchases, for the most part, this is negotiated through your sales contract, and almost always it's the sellers that determine who they want to use for escrow. But technically, you can make that part of your offer and request a different company, or you could even choose to use your own title company and escrow company. Um, very rarely do I see that. I don't think I would recommend it. It's better to have everything done at one place. But because you do technically have a choice uh, and the fact that you chose the property and negotiating the property, it was your choice from that sense. These fees have a tolerance where they can increase by more than 10% or up to 10%, I'm sorry, up to 10% and everything's fine. Lender hasn't done anything wrong and you would be responsible for those fees. If it exceeds 10% uh, of those fees, and um, then the lender would be responsible for that overage there. Now, um, there, again, there are some ex exceptions to that as far as if the lender made a recommendation on their fees, you know, they didn't know who the title, title company was. And so I'm going to say, for example, on a refinance, the lender says, okay, we're going to disclose our fees and we, we, this is the company we want to use. And you say, you know what? I don't want to use that company. I want to use this company. And then at that point, you're not going to use who you like and those fees could change by as much as they want because you chose to go with a different company than what the lender did and again that's typically going to be on a refinance um now this is where it gets a little bit confusing again different states this will look different so if you're in new jersey you're going to see some different stuff here but in oregon um here is a bunch of fees you might see on the title company most counties in oregon will not show a chain of title or a courier fee or edoc fee most of these fees would be tied into the escrow fee. But there are some counties that will actually have maybe a slightly lower escrow fee, but then they itemize out these fees. So again, not a big difference. You might see some, some differences there. What I really want to show here, though, is the title insurance policy. So th this is a lender's title insurance policy. This is to make sure that the, you have a clear title, that you know, there's, there's not going to be liens and judgments on the title mm -hmm. or a bunch of easements that would be a, of a concern to the lender. 
Um, and so, and also that nobody can come back after you fund the loan and say, Hey, we had a right, we had, you know, to some money here. So if they could produce a document that said they actually did have a legal right and it was recorded and the title company somehow missed that, then the title company would be uh, responsible for that. So that's what that insurance is. But in the state of Oregon, the seller pays most of this fee here. So again, this is a federal form for all 50 states. And since that's for all 50 states, they're required to show the full fee. But then down here under adjustments and other credits, you can see that even without negotiating a seller credit on your sales contract, you, you get 1,066 credit from the seller. This is their portion of the, their fee. So that's something to be a, a, aware of. Now, if you're doing a refinance, of course, there is no seller. So the full title fee becomes yours and there is no credit there. So here's how you get the total cost of A, B, and C. So these are actually more, I would say, costs of the loan and cost of buy-in. Do keep in mind, if you paid cash for the property, you're still going to have title and escrow fees associated with that. But you wouldn't necessarily require to you know, do an appraisal. You might want to get one just to make sure you're not overpaying, but you wouldn't have to do that. Then you definitely wouldn't need a credit report if you're paying cash for the home and you wouldn't have any of these fees up here. So let's jump back to the top over here for other costs. So these are other costs that are associated that you want to take into account. Um, the first one here is basically what we call the recording fees. This is something that the county is going to charge to record your deed of trust that shows that you now own the property, you're now entitled to that property, and that you have a loan secured against that property. And so that deed is going to be uh, cost is based on how many pages the deed turns out. So 375 is what they're quoting. Uh, this is probably going to come in like more like 350. But again, this will be something that within um, reason like the 10% here, this should be very, very close. Now, what can change by more uh, by as much as you want is this section here. And it's really tied to the homeowner's insurance. You have the choice to choose who you want to use for homeowner's insurance. The lender does not do this for you. And that's one of those many disclosures you're going to sign is a page that says, hey, just so you know, you can pick who you want. If your lender is telling you you have to use a certain company, uh, that's a red flag. I don't know if anybody would do that, but it's your choice. And because it's your choice, we do our best to estimate what that might cost. But again, every property have di uh, has different insurance costs. Every insurance company would insure the same property for a different rate. You might want additional coverage for I know, expensive cars or jewelry or whatever the case might be. And so we don't really know what you're going to decide to do for your home. You know, what deductible do you want? That kind of stuff. So we estimate it here. So they estimate 960, but you could get out some super platinum um, insurance policy, or maybe you've had a bunch of insurance claims in the past. And so now it's going to cost you more like 1500. Then this will be updated to reflect whatever your actual quote is when you provide it. But your insurance for the first year is paid in full. Okay. Now the prepaid interest here, when you close your loan, the interest starts running. We say the juice starts running as soon as you fund the loan. So in this case here, if you, you close the loan, there's two days left in the, end of the month. The lender wants everything to happen from the first to the first. And they always collect interest after they've earned it. So in say we're in June and you make your June payment, that represents May's interest being paid in June with a little bit of principal reduction. The exception to this time where a lender only collects it after they've earned it is at closing. And so in this case here, there's two days left in the month. They're going to collect $78.68. That's the daily interest on day one at closing so that everything goes now from the, the first to the first. So maybe you're closing on May 30th. So they're collecting the 30th and 31st. And then the interest starts incurring in June. And then July, you make your very first payment. So if you close with 30 days uh, in the month, that would be the worst case, I, I would say, 15 days. Whatever it is, this is going to change, but it's only changing by when you close. So again, this number can change as much as it needs to change based on the actual day you close. Maybe your loan goes really fast and lender can close super early, or maybe it took longer than expected and you were hoping to close at the end of the month, but it falls into the following month, and now they're collecting 15 days. That would be an example. Now, what gets really confusing here, but this is the last of the hard stuff here, and then this will be very uh, almost over quickly here, uh, but it's important. G here has to do with, again, we talked about on page one, how your taxes and your homeowner's insurance are built into your monthly payment. But there's a huge timing difference here. Um, and so I'll do my best to explain it. But again, if you have questions, always feel free to message me here. But let's give it a go here. So taxes are in the state of Oregon, 
the way our tax year runs is July 1st to July 1st. So that's your tax bill. Okay, it's not January to January. It's July 1st to July 1st. But you don't actually know what that bill is to pay your July bill until October. So in October, you actually receive the bill of what that year's taxes will be. And that year is going to go from July 1st of the year you're in to July 1st of the following year. Then it's due in November. So if you're going to close a loan in June, okay, and your first payment is not until August, you're not going to have 12 payments between August and November. So the lender has to collect enough money in advance to put that into that escrow account or the impound account that we talked about from which they will hold that money for you. It's your money held um, that they're holding your behalf and they'll make payments. Whenever you pay off your loan, whether you pay it off or you refinance, whatever they hold in that account at that time gets refunded back to you. So it's your money, but you have to account for this. So again, this is not a closing cost of the loan because you'll pay taxes regardless but it does get calculated in what you need to expect for cash to close. So that's why it's really important to understand that, that the closing costs on the loan side might only be um, the number you saw down below here, um, this number less this number in this scenario. Um, but you have to still account for this additional cost to closing if you're required or choosing to have tax insurance built into your payment. Now, homeowner's insurance, you paid a whole month here, 12 months. So why is the lender collecting some here? And this is, again, a federal form. And this is where it gets confusing. I wish they make the correction here. But, okay, so your homeowner's insurance, if you buy your house in June, your homeowner's insurance renews every year in June. So that's the first 12 months. But as I mentioned, you don't have a payment in July because you've already paid that interest at closing. So your first payment's in August. So there's no payment coming in that month. So the lender needs to collect a one month to account for the month of which you don't have a payment. And then from that point on, you will have made 11 months that gets you to 12. But the lender wants a cushion. They want to have a, a pad there because insurance typically goes up every year. So they typically will collect in total 14 months. But again, I'm showing 15. So why is that? Just hang with me. In addition to this escrow account, property taxes, it's the same thing. So you're, you're closing your house in June. You're not going to have a July payment. Property taxes are going to have to be paid in no, uh, November, which means October is your last time to contribute to that amount. Plus, the seller, if you close on June 1st, they've already paid for property taxes for the year in which you're buying up through July. I know this all gets really confusing. So, in short, most of the time, you're going to be paying about 10 and a half months worth of property taxes which accounts for what needs to go aside so there's enough money there for you to pay that in November. And you're going to put money aside to reimburse the seller because you now own the home, but they've already paid for your taxes. And the homeowner's insurance, you want 14 months. And just like the homeowner's insurance, the lender wants to have a one-month cushion because taxes go up every year. So why doesn't this not match up? I got 12 months of property taxes, 15 months here. And the reason is there is a number here. It's called an aggregate adjustment. It's a negative number that brings these accounts back into balance to meet federal law. A lender can only collect so much of a cushion. To exceed that, would to be, to be in, in, uh, above the allowable amount, they would then refund you the, how much they're over collecting and readjust your payment down if that ever happened. So unfortunately, because this is a federal form, you don't see that aggregate adjustment here. But at the end, when you get your closing disclosure, which will be later in our series, um, the closing disclosure so shows both sides of the seller uh, and the buyer side of the transaction. And then it actually does include the box that shows aggregate adjustment. So what I want you to kind of take away here is this does get kind of over-exaggerated. A lender can try to manipulate this down and under, uh, under disclose it so that it looks right on the loan estimate, but then they forget to make the change. It can make the closing disclosure look a little different. Just know that you should expect to pay about 14 months worth of homeowner's insurance and about 10 months 10 and a half months of uh, taxes, unless you're coming very, very close to when taxes are due and that, that could go up by about, to about 12 months. So just something to be aware of there. That's how that number gets together, but that's how we get our grand total number for the what we call prepaid. So all these are called prepaids. They're not loan costs. They're things you're essentially gonna pay for even if you bought the house for cash. And then they total that up and that's how you get to your total. And then down here, if you had your earnest money uh, cleared, you might see the credit for your earnest money. If you negotiated in the contract, the seller agreed to pay 
10,000 of your closing costs, you would then see a credit here. And then all of that would bring your cash to close down. So in this scenario, there's no earnest money deposited yet. And the seller is not paying any other closing costs that wasn't negotiated. And therefore, this is what they should expect. So that's the heart of the loan estimate. Okay, there's one more page to go over very, very quickly. But that's the heart of it. That's the fees. That's how it's broken down. You will see variation from state to state, from lender to lender, but it just needs to make sense. And if you do, then you're in good shape and you should be comfortable signing and moving forward. Now, page three here, I just want to show some things. Uh, here, what this is trying to show you is a couple things. If you had this loan for five years and then you sold the home or you refinanced it, it wants you to know that with your upfront closing costs that we just saw on page one, plus the interest you've been paying over the five years, assuming you never paid extra, you never paid late, um, and you never paid less, you just did what you're supposed to do, you would have spent $178,134 over five years in payments and closing costs, of which of this $178,000, $24,000 of that reduced your loan amounts. When you sell the house, you, if you sold it for the same price or more, you're going to get that $24,000. That's called principal reduction back. The annual percentage rate here, this is very confusing here. I should probably do a whole video on that. You're like, well, it doesn't make sense. You, my rate's supposed to be 6.9. That's what it shows on the first page. This is another pet peeve of mine. This is a federal form, so we can't change it. By federal law, in any other circumstance besides their own document, whenever a lender shows you an interest rate, they need to show you the APR rate at the same time. This doesn't matter if you're buying a car, you're getting a credit card. When they show rate, they show APR. So what is the APR rate? Very quickly, again, I'll just do another video on it. It's a simply a hypothetical rate saying that if you made your, uh, your payments on time every time for 30 years, uh, what was that total interest cost you paid? Plus, what are the costs associated with the loan? The mortgage insurance costs, you had that for 10 years, you know, we expected for 10 years. Um, the, the lender fees, the escrow fees, and it takes all that and it expresses it as an interest rate. Now, the theory is behind here is if everything you're comparing is 100% the same from one lender to the same lender, same day, same property, same loan amount, everything has to be 100% the same, then you can simply compare the APR rate and know who has the lower cost by the lower APR rate. Again, the problem with this is people think lower APR rate is always the better, and so they get sometimes tricked by online lenders where they're not necessarily tricking you, but they will always show a very low rate that might have very high costs associated with it because those costs are amortized over 30 years, it shows a low APR rate compared to somebody who's quoting a higher rate, which would then have a higher APR. But in reality, it might be a much lower cost loan for you based on how long you're in the loan because almost nobody's in the loan for 30 years. This last one here, tip, says if you have the loan for 30 years, the same thing, make your payments on time every time for 360 months, you will have paid 138.34% of your purchase price, or, um, or I mean your original loan amount, the loan amount, more. So you got a $100,000 loan over 30 years, you actually pay back $138,000. Uh, that's what that's showing. Okay. And nobody has it for 30 years. So this can be a scary number. So I just tell my clients, this is the power of compounding interest. This is why it's good to invest in things that actually earn you interest that you don't pay. But again, owning a home, major benefits, check out my other videos on that. Um, it's definitely worth, worth owning a home because rent is, um, is a hundred percent cost. Down here, Assumptions. So this just tells you um, the appraisal. We, we can order appraisal. The assumption means, in this case, the uh, will not be assumable. So this is not an loan that if you wanted to sell your house, the other buyer could not come in and just assume or take over your loan. FHA and VA loans, those are assumable. So that's possible, although they can only assume what's outstanding on the loan balance. They cannot assume the new purchase price. Plus, they have to show that they qualify. But this here, just let you know that this is not assumable, but it could be. Again, talks about homeowner's insurance. You get to choose your own. It lets you know that there is a late payment. So if you make your payment later than 15 days, so up to 15 days, the interest is always incurring. It's due on the first. But as long as you pay it by the 15th, they won't charge you a late payment fee. But after the 15th in this scenario, they're going to charge you 5% of the principal and interest payment. So not your loan amount, just the principal and interest payment. That's your late payment penalty. So I want to say beware of this because I have a lot of clients that think, oh, I'll just make a payment on the 15th. But because they're always uh, putting their payment in the 15th, it doesn't process until the 16th. They're incurring a 5% late payment penalty 
every single month and they never know it because they didn't go 30 days late. So it didn't get reported to the credit reporting company. And then when they go to pay off their loan, they realize they have like $800 or $1,000 of late payment penalties um, because they kept making the payment on the 16th. So don't do that. Um, and then the last big one I want to say here is servicing here. This just, does the lender intend to transfer your servicing? Almost always a lender is going to say this. If you're working with a portfolio lender, then it's possible that they always keep the loans on their books and it would be marked no. But even if a lender like us, who currently we keep maybe 80% of the servicing for our loans, we do have the right to sell it and we may sell it when the market changes. And so the intent to, uh, to mark, to transfer, Transferring your servicing does not change anything about the loan we just looked at. The loan is funded. Your rate is fixed. It just means who do you send the money to? That changes. So think of the servicer like the property management company. You're renting the home. That's your interest on the loan. The lender owns the, um, the loan. So they're the property owner. The servicer is the property manager. That's who you're going to deal with. Um, and they might transfer who's going to deal with that based on who buys the loan. So there you have it. Again, very long video, but it's really important. I hope you liked it. Uh, again, if you have questions and comments down below, put uh, just put those down below. I'll get back to those as soon as possible. If you have a, somebody who's looking at buying a property, and they're confused by the process, hopefully this video will help. All right, until next time.